Well, hello everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for having me over here for the class. Uh, this is ES week educa education class, I believe. Um, if you've been a press talk talking about the spiking neural networks, um, this is a nitro continuous in class. We will move to uh, neuromorphic computing. Essentially, it's a hardware realization of uh, biological format the neural network. Um, so I will start with an overview and talking about what is the neuromorphic computing, what is the basic components required in uh, neuromorphic computing. And then afterwards, and I will introduce uh, some of our research, including our run based and neuromorphic uh, hardware design. And then uh, since neuromorphic itself and involve not only about the hardware designs, but also uh, software and algorithm development. So um, I will uh, give a few examples of the software and the hardware co-design and see how the approach can improve the efficiency and the reliability. Um, at the end, I will conclude the talk um, with the uh, you know, discussion of the challenges and opportunities. So um, I couldn't say um, the chat window very well, but if you have any questions and feel free to interrupt me and uh, I'll ask the question, okay. All right, so that's move on. Um, so in the first part, overview of the neuromorphic um, I will start with a general introduction of an art, uh, artificial intelligence and then uh, move to the definition of a neuromorphic computing and also the basis of a neuromorphic computing. Okay. So in fact, if we wanted to talk more about uh, you know, artificial intelligence and perhaps the first question is and what is intelligence? Um, uh, as a human being, uh, we kind of are curious as uh, what happens in our mind and what enable the creativity, the thinkings and, and the sounds of first. So like Dr. Wooden said, our mind is so fortunately equipped. Um, it brings us the most important basis for our thought with our having the least knowledge of this work of elaboration. And the uh, the understanding of intelligence um, has been coached in the technology development of the time. So you can imagine in old days and um, Asian people think the strain of the marinades and can mimic and provide a certain intelligence. But later on, and with the progress of the science and technologies, we know better um, you know, in terms of um, uh, neuroscience and biology mechanisms and getting better understanding. Um, so in the past like 100 years also, one of the fundamental finding uh, was by my colleague and the Pitts. Um, they abstract, simplify and abstract and saying our brain connections and can be taken as a switching network. And of course, in recent years, and we know better about our brain um, and understand as an information processing system and the system itself uh, involve like neuron dynamics, uh, sensibilities, um, and also chemical and physical uh, processing mechanisms. Um, so, I mean, if we have a rough, concepts and definition for the intelligence, we can move to what is the artificial intelligence. There been a lot of discussion about this. Um, well, a common understanding is and uh, the idea was formed back to 1956 in Dartmouth summer research project on artificial intelligence. It was a summer workshop last for two months and the 10 famous speakers at the time, researchers at the time, uh, give the talk and had a roundtable discussions, okay? And the picture over here, the bottom picture actually uh, was shot 50 years later uh, in 
2006. So five of the 10 speakers at the time attend this 50 year anniversary uh, celebration. So um, through the thorough discussions, um, artificial intelligence was defined as the theory and development of computer system that, that is able to perform tasks normally requiring human intelligence, such as in visual perception, speech recognition, uh, recognition decision-making, and also translation between language. Um, the application domains now has been extended dramatically as well. So um, with the definition of the artificial intelligence, we can say this is the ultimate goal we would like to achieve eventually with our software and hardware systems. And then in recent years, and there have been a lot of efforts on machine learning and particularly deep learning. And those are being taken as the methodologies to achieve this target. So at this time, let me derive to the technology landscape a little bit and see uh, you know, what we have been done on the road to achieve the artificial intelligence. Well, the technology landscape uh, page, uh, I actually grabbed it from uh, Dr. Hinton. He gave a presentation on perspectives on neuromorphic computing back to 2016. Um, so as you can say, like years ago, uh, when computer was invented, uh, most of them are personal computings and they were uh, wired. They, I mean, they could be connected through the wired internet um, and it's kind of a local internet, okay? So um, uh, through so many years and the entire computing systems has been advanced. Um, one major uh, direction of the advancement is from 100% programming to more and more uh, learning capabilities. So um, one of the way to understand that is in the large, the development of a large infrastructure of a data center or a cloud we mentioned, right? So through so many devices and integrate together, we are able to uh, store large scale of the data we are able to collecting those data through uh, a lot of an edge devices and also locally, and then um, through the large scale computations to process those data. So, um, you know, with large amount of the data and uh, uh, high density storage, large scale computing, computing capabilities, uh, the system itself be able to analyze this data and therefore provide self-learning capability. Um, another domain is in, uh, uh, another domain of um, progress is in moving from static offline um, to more dynamic and online. So it becomes in, engaged with the real world. Um, so one clear uh, advantage of this is in, instead of to have a dex, uh, desktop and workstations, um, they are also more like edge devices, like the mobile phones. So for those edge devices we mentioned, it's not only can uh, compute, they also uh, be able to sensing, uh, display the information so that can interact with the human beings, right? Uh, it uh, can interact uh, with the cloud, for instance, and through wireless communication and internet. Uh, it can uh, collect data locally as well. So um, the device itself, and um, you know, not only about the computation itself, and, but be able to interact uh, with the environment uh, and also um, uh, you know, uh, offer, uh, grab the support from uh, cloud. So if we taking the entire uh, scheme all together, eventually what we are looking for is the intelligence systems in various in scale. It could be uh, like uh, small things like robotics. It could be really large things in like self-driving cars or the system of autonomous cars. Uh, well, if we can uh, extend our uh, mind, uh, eventually uh, we're also thinking about, uh, about the smart grid, smart cities and 
So everything, um, 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 you know, uh, can be covered under this scheme. And obviously, this is not just a one layer uh, or one single device, and, but, um, you know, the integration of the entire systems across in different domains and uh, different layers. And essentially, we hope such uh, intelligent systems can learn um, and can dynamically interact with uh, the environment, uh, interact with the human beings um, and be part of an, uh, you know, our real world execution. So how to achieve that? Generally speaking, some people believe data collection, um, network development, and also the hardware designs and are essentially three um, uh, important components. Um, and uh, we can see that the, the development of a neural network um, has been advanced in, um, in past in 70, 80 years, right? I mentioned previously uh, about the uh, network um, structures, uh, abstractions and proposed by Dr. Michalik and the Pitts back to 1943. Um, this is a very initial version of electronic brain. Okay. And afterwards, and people have done uh, tremendous, a lot of works. Uh, for example, uh, we're talking about the perception network development and uh, afterwards the other lines and adaptive linear neurons um, are able to conduct the training functionalities. Um, then a uh, multi-layer neural network were proposed and uh, the proposal of the multi-neural networks and enriched functionalities can be offered by um, a neural network architectures. And uh, uh, neural cognition was the initial version of the convolution neural network. Uh, it's brought the concepts of an, um, uh, you know, convolution and also down sampling and the growth of the network. And uh, um, this enables the processing of an, uh, 2D images. Um, well, uh, back propagation was the techniques and proposed to train the multiple layer neural networks. Um, there have been some dark age and due to the, uh, 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 due to the uh, vanish, uh, gradient vanishing problems, but um, since in 2001, uh, GPU has been used and for trainings and we're able kind of and grow the network depths uh, furthermore. Um, Theoretically uh, wise and restricted, restricted uh, bus band machines are, are also advanced versions and, and enable the uh, further progress of the uh, deep neural networks. Well, um, so we have uh, uh, talking about there have been a lot of an, uh, progress in network development. Um, another dimension is the data exploration, okay? So if we took all the data that was created in the world between uh, beginning of the time and to very latest, um, the same of amount of data uh, is now generated every few minutes. And uh, in fact, over 90% of the data in the world was created in the past couple of years. Okay, so here I just give some uh, examples. Um, to demonstrate it, um, to demonstrate how much data uh, were created every minute. It's measured by number of emails, uh, likes on Facebook, tweets, uh, photos, and the videos uploaded to the uh, cloud. Um, so as I mentioned previously on technology landscape, uh, you know, with uh, a lot of an edge devices, and with the uh, cloud and data centers, and we are able to collect the data and then integrate the data uh, at the cloud and the data center. Um, but from another perspective, and the data center consume uh, uh, quite a large amount of the data, sorry, electro uh, electricity as well. So um, I think the data, uh, uh, this number um, back to 2012 around, at that time, data center consumes uh, like 1.5% of um, all words in electricity. Um, 
in the Google's data center, uh, for example, draw almost 260 million watt of power, which is more power than uh, Salt Lake City uses. Okay, so uh, how to improve the data storage and the processing capability, and therefore uh, improve the data processing efficiency becomes an uh, important topic. Um, people have been working on um, the hardware designs and trying to make the AI uh, processing more efficient. So there have been a lot of um, approaches on CMOS-based AI chips design. Okay? And uh, on the left-hand side, um, I show a um, die photo of a common like AI chip designs. Okay? So in the middle is the function unit core. Uh, it's mainly like multiply arrays and uh, the blue part illustrated the on-chip memory, uh, including like hot buffer, cold buffer, input and output buffers. Um, and then control units are essentially necessary to help um, allocate and exchange the data between the function unit and the local buffer and also uh, between the on-chip memories uh, and off-chip memories. So um, currently the AI chip design, um, especially on CMOS uh, domains, mainly utilize in a few uh, following approaches. For example, increase the size of the multiplier arrays so that the local computation capabilities and can be improved. Uh, increase the on-chip memory capabilities and so more data can be contained on the chip. And we don't have to have a lot of it, uh, data exchange uh, to external memory. Well, uh, increase the data bandwidth between the memory and the function units. And in this way, so, uh, the data exchange between the two parts um, can be more flexible uh, and faster. And therefore uh, it's uh, generally enhanced the data processing capabilities. Um, so one thing we noticed that through all these uh, approaches, um, generally speaking, the chip size increases, the hardware design and the fabrication cost increases, and also uh, the power consumption uh, is very hard to be constrained. Okay. Um, nevertheless, um, there have been tremendous effort in academia and industry intend to accelerate the DNS um, on conventional platforms. So uh, when I mentioned about conventional platforms, it's including microprocessors, um, DSP chips, and also dedicating um, AI chip designs. And uh, the figure over here clearly show there is an efficiency versus and flexibility trade-offs. Um, so one thing I wanted to emphasize or draw your attention here is in, it's not only about the trade-off at hardware designs. There's also mismatch between uh, what we can achieve at uh, algorithm level versus the uh, capability offered by the hardware design. Um, so we give several examples uh, here. So one simple example, um, for example, uh, quantization has been uh, used in DNN designs. Um, so it's related to the precision of the weight and activation in um, uh, uh, deep neural networks, right? In algorithm level, in fact, the, the quantization uh, issue wasn't very obvious. And, uh, double precision, high precision is particularly important especially for the training processes. Uh, for hardware designs and uh, you know, low precisions and can improve the uh, uh, efficiency training uh, execution for sure. However, when we switch in between the algorithm and hardware, uh, sorry, when we switch in between the high precision with the low precisions uh, in hardware, in algorithm designs, it's just a line of the code. Um, for the hardware, and we have to consider and be able to support uh, low precision 
are fixed point data format. And this is why um, like early generation machines and CPUs and GPUs and were not able uh, to benefit uh, much from, uh, for example, quantization techniques because the hardware itself didn't support it. All right, so um, after the introduction of an artificial intelligence, um, I will uh, jump into the main topic of today's lecture, uh, neuromorphic computing. Um, this is an, uh, one of my favorite slides. I use it um, quite often. Um, and the, the page uh, was the prediction by Dr. Kuswell back to uh, 1990. Um, so it's, um, it's like 30 years ago. So 30 years ago, uh, he measured the computing power by million instruction per second, and then project approximately 2020 or even early, we are able to achieve uh, the intelligence level of monkey or close to the human beings. Well, we all know that our computing systems in Noel day is very powerful, but not sufficient, uh, or we couldn't claim it's um, at the same level as in human being. Um, so it's not only about the computing power, but also the uh, architecture and the framework sense to support, to innovate the computations. So a sufficiently advanced computer program uh, that could exhibit human level intelligence uh, is uh, still uh, not fully developed. So this actually introduced the concept of the neuromorphic computing. So it's not only the program, it's not only about the hardware, we have to integrate them together. And the goal of a neuromorphic computing is to use via VLSI systems to mimic neural biological architecture present in the nervous system. And as you can say, neuromorphic computing is, uh, must be a interdisciplinary uh, technology. Um, it's involved uh, biology, uh, physicists, mathematics, computer science, and electrical engineers, and all the perspectives, okay? Um, in recent times, and the term of a neuromorphic has also been used to describe analog, digit, or uh, mixed mode uh, analog digital website design and software systems. Um, so, um, uh, you know, um, this is an, uh, what we uh, offer and uh, work together right now. So, in order to build neuromorphic computings, I guess an um, rough understanding at least on our human brain uh, would be helpful. So if you take a look at an, a very top view of our brains, and our uh, brain uh, um, in fact has a complex structure. It contains in, um, you know, about 20 billion neurons. It um, exhibits some very complicated uh, connections, um, but its power consumption is in very low compared to the existing computing systems. It only consumes in like 25, around 35 watt uh, averagely. And uh, looking into the structures and the brain contains the gray manner for thinking and the white manner for uh, signal transmission, okay? And if we get into the gray manner, the neural cortex usually we call, um, it is the major part for uh, uh, thinking or the data processing, right? It contains in six layers and the, the signal can transmit within the layers and between the layers. So, uh, you know, this level of abstraction helps to uh, generate or help people create um, uh, cortical models like uh, hierarchical temporal models. Okay? Uh, we can also uh, get into the details and um, and we all know that, uh, uh, in fact, that the basic elements of uh, brains are made by neuron for processing signals and from other neurons, and also the synapse um, 
that actually uh, can be taken as a memory effect and await the signals and passing to, through it. Okay, so um, this level of uh, understandings and helps and build like neural synaptic models. Uh, we mentioned about, you know, uh, deep neural network or the neural network concepts are um, fully connected uh, structures and between the pre-neuron and the post-neurons. There are also uh, the studies on the Habin network were coming from this um, lower, uh, lower uh, level understanding. Um, generally speaking, and um, summarized by Professor Maya uh, from Germany, there are three characteristics that brain have, but computer um, systems nowadays and do not have yet. One is extremely low power consumption. I mentioned the brain power consumption is only about 35 watt. Fault tolerant, the self recover mechanisms and the tolerance of the fault, um, the, the, for example, input signals. And also um, the current computing systems lack uh, the need to be programmed. So um, adaptivities or self-learning capabilities are, uh, is very, very important. Um, I like to, uh, uh, I mean, uh, I like to summarize the characteristics of a neuromorphic computing quickly um, based on our uh, discussion so far. Um, usually when we're talking about the neuromorphic computing, and it's referred to the devices or the systems, at least the, um, have the following properties and those can be taken as the basic properties. Um, it contains in two types of the basic components, neurons and synapses that we mentioned. Um, usually um, it's co-located it has in co-located memory and computations, meaning computation is conducted where the data is stored. Uh, from computing system developed perspectives, and this can reduce the uh, cost of a data exchange and improve the computation or the processing efficiency. The ways and of uh, signal communicate. Um, between components is important as well. So uh, general understanding is and locally, their dense connection, but globally, uh, the communication is sparse. Um, so the overall structures tend to be simple uh, in order, uh, like for efficiency purposes. And the last learning in the components is very important. And when we're talking about the learnings, and there are also two goals, like the learnings of the entire system. So you can think it or analog this as to like DNA systems. What is the uh, overall functionality is offered? Uh, we also concern um, and interested in the learning capability at the locals, like uh, for uh, you know uh, local components levels. Uh, what types of learning? Uh, algorithms or the models and how it, does it affect the, uh, the big application. There are um, also some additional common characteristics. Um, for example, the nonlinear uh, dynamics is essentially important. Uh, it helps to en enrich the functionalities and, uh, at a system level. Um, high fan in and fan out components uh, will be necessary uh, when we're talking about the large scale development, okay? Um, spiking behavior. Um, so there have been a lot of study and discussion about the spiking neural network, um, spiking uh, encoding schemes. And so uh, spiking itself and has been taken as the most efficient data representation uh, method. How to uh, process uh, spiking data, however, uh, remain as an uh, interesting and hot research topic. The ability to adapt and learn through plasticity of both parameters, events, and the structure. 
Um, what I meant over here, again, learning uh, shall be conducted at the different layers and it could be uh, in the different ways, right? So the lower level uh, uh, learning or adaptivities and versus the entire systems and um, could be uh, related, um, but different. Robustness and is always a uh, concern uh, when we developing the entire systems. And uh, um, this uh, in fact um, can be uh, combined with the ability to handle noisy and incomplete inputs. So robustness here uh, can be taken as in self-healing and recovery capabilities. And then uh, the next item is saying if there's a uh, noisy or incomplete inputs and from external environment, the system uh, are still be able to process, uh, process it with a certain uh, a minimal, uh, me meaningful behavior for the results. Um, temporal interaction and event-driven, um, it's related to the spiking behavior here, okay? Um, so at a here, I basically introduced about the neuromorphic computing. I guess in common question previously in class I received is what is the difference of machine learning versus in neuromorphic computing, okay? So um, usually when we talk about the machine learnings and uh, we uh, tend to uh, focusing on data and the algorithm, um, so mainly is in how to advance the algorithm levels in order to enhance the data processing. There are also uh, data techniques like uh, argumentations to uh, 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 help and improve the algorithm's performance like uh, uh, accuracy. Well, uh, in neuromorphic computing, we integrate data algorithm and also the uh, computing system machine uh, into the design components. So um, the concept here is that the machine shall be part of it and help uh, provide efficient and fast uh, functionalities. Um, so this is the major difference. That's why in later on, and when I'm talking about the neuromorphic computing and uh, the software and hardware co-design is a very important uh, thread. So, um, well, so this is basically uh, to tend to answer the question, what is a neuromorphic computing? And the next, I will briefly introduce the basis of a neuromorphic computing and the discussion, what is the major uh, research lines in, uh, in the field? Okay. So uh, again, um, when talking about the neuromorphic computing, okay, hardware is an important component, but it is not the only part of the systems. If we um, put into the uh, domain of um, computing, uh, in current days. And so, you know, uh, how to collecting the data, how to program um, the algorithms and then translate the algorithm to the uh, hardware designs. And those are all essentially very important. We can also tend to understand the uh, abstractions in biological brains and can say, uh, what functions and they follow, okay? So um, the figure over here, given example, as you can see at the very lower level, the sodium iron um, channels, and um, this is an analog to the uh, very basic development elements. Um, and at this levels, the spiking dynamics were generated and uh, um, that's um, kind of an, the first level processing uh, mechanism. Well, um, the neural um, genesis is the process of new neurons are formed in the brain. And altogether of this, and um, this forms the information encoding mechanisms like activation and also the generation of the neurons. Okay, 
So in this way, a network kind of can be uh, formed um, and the, the data representation um, will uh, initialize at this level. Uh, the dungeon tagirus is uh, part of the hippocamel trisynapsis circuits. Um, the goal of here is to uh, uh, kind of an, uh, form new episodic memories. Um, it's also have the capabilities and often um, explore novel environment spontaneously and offer uh, kind of an adaptive functionalities. So uh, at this level, Shen, you know, uh, it's more alike to the uh, higher behaviors like pattern separations. Um, um, it's also related to some advanced features in DNNs like one short learning, uh, hardware wise and associate memories and so on so forth, okay. Um, so how uh, would that to affect um, neuromorphic computing or guide the development of the neuromorphic computing? So generally speaking, then we could form this and from a different perspective. For example, neural model, it's analog to the very lower uh, data processing capabilities, right? Um, so uh, when we're talking about the neural models, um, it's defined what components um, make up the network and how um, these uh, components operate and how these components interact, right? So the figure here gave an overview of types of uh, neural models have been implemented in hardware level. Um, basically, uh, it can be divided into um, five catalogs. Um, biological plausible um, are those models uh, tend to uh, model the types of behavior that are seen in biological neural systems. Right, so this is a uh, closely uh, mimic the biological systems, and then the biological inspired model uh, tend to replicate the um, replicate the behavior of biological neural systems, but it doesn't have to strictly follow the uh, biological plausible way. Okay, um, well, uh, when we talk about this, and so the neural. Um, the neural and other models over here, um, including um, biological inspired components, not purely include uh, in other neuromorphic neural models. So uh, here it's kind of related to the biological inspired and plausible, and it's more focusing on uh, lower level component modeling. And um, so, for example, exon models and dungeon models, uh, gila cells and so on so forth, okay. Um, we also have an integrant of fire. This and taking this in simpler category of um, biological inspired um, uh, neural models and, and uh, we have it separately because uh, many of the existing, for example, SNN designs are uh, heavily rely on integrant and fire. It's simple, but quite uh, efficient. Um, my colleague and Pitt's neural models are the um, derivative of the originally uh, my colleague Pitt's neuron. And uh, um, this and can be taken as the uh, connection uh, or the bridge of a deep neural network, okay? So we talk about the neurons, right? Um, and then the next question is how does uh, neurons are connected? Basically, um, the network models to be used. And on this page, and we give an overview of the network models also uh, commonly used in the neuromorphic systems, okay? Um, there are a wide variety of uh, uh, network models have been deployed for neuromorphic systems. Um, they um, also range from uh, replicating biological behavior closely to, uh, uh, you know, closely to the uh, bioplausible models. They also have the version of um, computation-driven non-spiking uh, models. Um, so there are also a lot of factors to consider 
when we select the network models, uh, one of them is, in, uh, as we mentioned, uh, the more bio uh, plausible, the more close to biological systems, the complexity of the neural and the synapse designs could be high. So there is a trade-off of the functionality, uh, the mimicking behaviors, and also hardware implementation uh, complexities. Also, uh, the topology of the network is quite important. So they are uh, connected in, for example, fee forward ways or through recurrent, uh, recurrent connection is uh, supported, whether the sto stochastic behaviors are integrated into the synapses and, uh, or not, they are represented by uh, continuous and values were represented by the uh, discrete uh, and, uh, 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 spiking uh, signals. So those are um, also need to be considered. Um, the feasibility and the applicability of the existing training and learning algorithms and could um, also be considered over here. Like uh, we you're talking about the back propagations from DNS. We also uh, have the plasticity related training algorithms. And um, so when we select the, the network models, essentially, uh, you know, we need to consider um, uh, the following training algorithms as well. So, um, well, um, I perhaps didn't, uh, 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 yeah, I haven't um, I mentioned this uh, figures. This figure actually shows the trend of uh, most frequently used models in neuromorphic implementation over time. So for example, as you can say, uh, spiking neural network uh, has been explored uh, more in recent years. Uh, fee forward uh, has always been studied for its uh, simplicity. Well, um, I mentioned about the importance of uh, training algorithms. And so there are several major um, uh, open questions and for the neuromorphic systems and uh, revolved around the algorithms, right? So when we're choosing the algorithms and we need to considering, for example, uh, the model I mentioned on previous page, uh, whether like new devices are considered, um, are we uh, talking about the learning on chip? Uh, are we uh, talking about learning has to be done quickly, like online training? Um, and then uh, where the training need to be take place, how su successful uh, or uh, broad uh, applications, um, those training algorithms need to be support. And uh, of course, then would you like to be more like a biological uh, plausible uh, or, um, like biological inspired um, should be uh, sufficient. So uh, on the table here, we summarize in some of those in factors for where's algorithm. Um, again, I guess in, when we're choosing the neural models, the connecting models, and also the algorithm, uh, essentially they all entangle together to finalize them, what kind of uh, uh, to, to finalize them were necessarily determined by uh, implementing the hardwares. Um, talking about the hardware implementations, and there have been many, many uh, proposed uh, uh, like terms. Well, um, I think simply speaking, and you know, um, we can divide it into digital analog and also mixed um, digital analog designs. Any questions? Okay, so um, I mean, the uh, exactly execution ways or uh, the implementation methods and could be very different. Um, we, uh, okay, so um, in industry, in fact, uh, uh, new architecture and systems have been um, extensively explored um, in different, uh, uh, you know, uh, in different ways. And well, uh, for example, this is an arm, uh, uh, SpyNike was supported by Human Brain Project at Europe. 
uh, it's using uh, ARM core together with the DDR SD RAM uh, integrate together to enable uh, the neuromorphic computing. Okay. Um, we usually also take Google Tensor processing units as a way. Um, it's a dedicating ASIC design for machine learnings. Okay. Um, I guess then more importantly, or more bio uh, plausible closer uh, implementation are the um, IBM True North and the uh, Intel Loihi. So as you can say, um, IBM True North um, integrate 4,000 neuron synaptic cores. So the first version actually offer many neurons, uh, 256 million synapse. Uh, and uh, the chip, uh, the first version actually didn't integrate the training capabilities, but offer extremely low power inference processing capability. Um, Intel Loihi um, is taking another step and it tend to have an online training capability. Um, so its core becomes more complicated and therefore the number of the cores and integrate on each design is uh, fewer. Um, but uh, uh, you know, the overall number of uh, the neurons and the synapses are still quite uh, dramatic. So, uh, um, you know, uh, recently, September 30th, and they announced the second version of an Loihi designs as well. We, uh, I compare um, some neuromorphic chip designs. Um, you don't have to go through those in details, and, but if you're interested, you know, feel free to go to those uh, references and to get the uh, uh, details. Okay. Um, one thing I also wanted to mention for the neuromorphic design for now, um, it's a very alike um, CPU, sorry, GPU uh, in our current systems. And uh, usually they take as in the coprocessors. So um, um, like GPUs or neuromorphics and they all take co-process, uh, taking as in co-processors. And so CPU usually is still necessary to help and manage allocated data and so on so forth. Okay. So uh, for example, if you have any programs and go through the compilers and the CPUs and will help to uh, partition those instructions and then uh, uh, send the request to the GPUs and the neuromorphic accelerators. Okay. Um, one important um, uh, research field in uh, neuromorphic computing system design is to use an emerging, uh, particularly memory devices. Uh, the reason is, and um, as you can, uh, if you re recall, uh, when we mentioned about the human brains, right? It's very um, dense uh, design with a billion of uh, neurons, right? Uh, very, uh, uh, so the connections across uh, those neurons is pretty complicated. Well, it's all for extremely low power consumption. So what happens into um, CMOS where one of the challenge in CMOS design is to provide compatible computation power with extremely low uh, uh, power consumptions. Um, the new uh, memory devices, emerging memory devices, and could open uh, the uh, opportunity. And therefore, um, those uh, new de uh, devices has been extensively studied um, and that they're used in neuromorphic computing and kind of, again, uh, a lot of attentions. So if you're looking at the, the, the chart here, uh, MemoryStore uh, is still perhaps the most um, widely used at device level components in neuromorphic systems. Um, so memory store were um, theoretical circuit elements proposed by Professor Leo Chu at UC Berkeley back to uh, 1971. Um, and then it was found or discovered by researchers at HP labs in 2008. So um, it has an, um, I will explain later on, it has a very simple structure uh, uh, and offer high uh, density uh, connections and therefore has been studied uh, 
quite widely. But there are also many other uh, devices uh, being studied. Um, for example, conductive bridging RAM, um, phase change memories, and those are all considered as an um, non-volatile memory um, with a very, very high uh, density. So in recent years, I guess, and spin-based device and uh, gained a lot of attention as well. So spintronic devices um, have been considered for neuromorphic implementation because they allow different tunable functionalities and they are compatible with the CMOS designs, okay? Um, so the type of the spintronic devices in neuromorphic systems and could include spin transfer torque, uh, spin wave devices, and also uh, magnetic domain walls. And so uh, although they all catalog as in spin-based devices and their physical implementation could be uh, very different. Um, another uh, you know, um, emerging topics uh, is um, the optical implementation. Um, that include optical and photonic components. Um, I guess in early days of neuromorphic computings and optical implementation were considered because then they are inherently um, can offer parallel processing. Um, so, but it was also noted that the implementation of uh, the storage of optical uh, information is difficult. Um, so the implementation became less popular for several decades, but recently opt opt optical implementation and the photonic platform uh, re-emerged because in their potential for uh, actual fast operation and uh, uh, you know, relatively uh, moderated complexity uh, and the programmability. So, um, you know, this is the uh, new, very recent uh, topic. Um, software stack. So again, um, Although, you know, when we're talking about the neuromorphic computings and perhaps in half of the efforts were uh, focusing on the hardware levels and see how to develop the VSS systems to support algorithms and the applications, right? Um, but uh, um, the entire systems, in fact, uh, is not only the hardware. Uh, uh, software stack is necessary to support it. Okay. In fact, uh, uh, for whatever hardware system we developed, uh, it's uh, need to be uh, able, it need to be integrated to the existing software stack, or uh, we have to create a dedicating software stacks and um, so that you can um, interact with the external uh, data and applications. Mm, there have been a lot of discussions on what applications uh, will be uh, useful for uh, or will benefit more from the neuromorphic computing systems. I guess and very likely um, those applications and uh, like deep learning can do but do not perform very well, that could be the opportunity for the neuromorphic computings. Um, and uh, essentially we do believe like a neuromorphic computing can do uh, the deep learning uh, can offer as well. So, I mean, uh, several examples over here. For example, uh, um, for the neural network applications and that need to process and not only spatial information, but also temporal uh, information, things in neuromorphic and computing itself and naturally have um, both capabilities and, and therefore it's easier and, uh, and therefore it's easier and natural. Um, also, biological simulation applications, and um, that's a very important thread in neuroscience. And uh, when they try to understand the biological structure, um, you know, of the brain systems, and, and they right now they also using a lot of them, um, large cluster of the GPUs and for the simulation. Well, uh, neuromorphic computing can provide a natural uh, hardware mimic. Uh, 
for biological simulations, and therefore uh, there could be uh, benefits from this uh, naturally. So um, this page actually end my introduction or overview of neuromorphic computing. Um, I would like to emphasize at this time is, in, first of all, neuromorphic computing is a multidisciplinary research topic uh, from like biological um, engineering to uh, computing computer science, uh, hardware de designs, and also a lot of people working on the materials and uh, were contributing to the area. And the topic wise, and uh, it's also uh, kind of an, um, related to the theories, to architecture designs and system development and uh, 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 device and the materials. And so different domains and kind of uncover uh, different topics and but we need to uh, all work uh, holistically together. Okay, so this um, actually is the end of uh, the first part overview. And afterwards, I will introduce in some of our research works in the area. Um, I will start with the um, system designs or chip designs and majorly focus on uh, RM-based neuromorphic chip design. And then I will move to the uh, software and hardware co-design part, right? So in part two, um, um, I will start with the introduction of a memory stir, and then um, moving to spiking processing engine design. And this is in like uh, uh, quite detailed um, explanations. And then for the followings, and I will quickly go through single spiking processing uh, engine design and accelerator design. Okay, so those are brief and quick. Um, during the talk, actually, um, I will put uh, some references in, at the bottom on the slides. So you could uh, refer uh, those uh, references and um, if you're interested. Um, in case in any difficulties, then feel free to email me and I'd be happy to point you to the link as well. Okay. So um, I mentioned new devices has been used in extensively in neuromorphic system development. And uh, one of the popular device has been investigated is Memister, or uh, we call mental oxide resistive random access memory uh, RM devices, okay? So one of the reasons it becomes uh, quite common is in its simple structure. It's a uh, thin film um, oxide and has in two terminals. And the one we apply external voltage across the devices, if the external voltage is exceed um, the threshold, then the resistance level will be changed. Okay. Otherwise, if the uh, external voltage is uh, smaller than the threshold, the resistance level will remain unchanged. Okay. So we say it can be taken as an um, programmable resistor with the analog state. And we are able to program the device, change the device resistance. And also we could sense the device uh, resistance levels and for the computation, okay. Um, another uh, important feature of a uh, memory store or RM is an, it could be developed into the crossbar structure shown here. So, um, as you can see, um, the yellow lines and demonstrate the mental uh, horizontally and vertically, okay? Um, at the cross point of uh, any two mental uh, wires, there could be made a um, uh, memory device. So the structure itself is quite uh, simple uh, with a very high density. And when we looking into its operations, illustrated here, right? Here are the uh, array structures in uh, horizontal wire and uh, vertical wire, and at a cross points, and there's a memory store device. So if we take a group of uh, inputs and supply from the left hand side and collecting the current um, at the bottom, okay, and this um, is 
very high level abstract views, and this can be taken as an weighted submission of the weighted input, the weight corresponding to the conductance level um, of those uh, memory store devices. And uh, this, in fact, is a nitro matrix operation. Um, so matrix operation has been used and you know uh, widely in um, machine learning, deep learning, uh, and of course, and it's uh, very important in neuromorphic implementation as well. So as you can see, such a device offer uh, very natural um, and high density implementations and uh, for synap synaptic functionality. And that's why it's gained uh, quite attention in recent years. Um, in our groups and started working on this and perhaps in 10 years ago, um, our first version successful demonstration was based on the uh, brain state in the box or BSB algorithm. Um, the algorithm um, have an, of course, in training, uh, training and the recall part. And it's a recall um, is simple compared to the other uh, network designs. Um, we can take XT as the input of the time T, okay? So what's required over here is an, it's go through and compute it with the matrix A. Um, and then the output uh, will go through a scratch function, meaning have a maximum and a minimal uh, value. And then uh, we can compare the new generate output XT plus one, okay? So if the new output is the same as an um, XT input, and then we say, uh, you know, the entire system converges and we stop operation. Otherwise, then XT plus one will be used as the input of next iteration T plus one. So it is an iterative process. Well, um, during the uh, demonstrations, and what we do is an initial input is uh, represented by an or vector of a voltage and supplies to the memory store crossbar arrays. Well, here we use in two crossbar array because in original algorithm, the weight terms it could be positive and a negative. Um, and in physical implementations and the conductance of the devices must be positive. So we use one to represent the positive part and another to represent the negative part. So the output will be processed and through the summing amplifiers and generate um, VT plus one, okay? And then we do compare whether it converge reached. Um, if not, the new output will be supplied as the input of next iteration. So this um, design uh, is able to mimic the algorithm structures. Um, I actually removed the result page and due to the time limit, but you can refer our uh, papers and for more details. Um, for the BSP implementations, and we uh, realized not only the inference, but also the training. And uh, the training designs uh, were developed based on the uh, inference and components like majorly over here. So we have um, some actual circuit components to support the uh, input processings, uh, training signal generations, and also the error detection. Um, I don't have to go to those in details, and, but major difference in, uh, we made at the time um, is in how to represent the data. So if you're looking at the original delta root algorithms, and we need to get the computated the uh, uh, true prediction results and compare with the target and do uh, subtraction operations and time with the exactly input value, okay? So first of all, this operation involved the multiplication of a high precision data. And secondly, uh, in order to obtain uh, all this in details is harder uh, in uh, uh, hardware design. Okay, so what we propose is a uh, modification to reduce the uh, data complexities. And what we have is to use the sign um, instead of an, um, the exactly computation results and to represent the difference and uh, 
the input data. And uh, so for the conductance and change, every iteration will be like increase um, slightly or decreasing slightly. It's made the local execution a lot of simpler and do not have to uh, read the data of the weight matrices, okay? Uh, obviously, it's uh, increased the uh, convergence uh, iteration necessary. So, but, um, you know, this is a hardware implementation. So each iteration is much, much faster than the algorithm level. So eventually uh, it shows like uh, it's a still be able to uh, uh, train the network quickly. Um, from very top level, uh, the design of an um, RM-based neuromorphic systems and can be taken as a spike-based or level-based. So level-based uh, follow the original uh, AN designs, uh, like all the data are presented by, uh, for example, analog uh, values. Um, and in order to do this and, uh, and make compatible with the externals, then we usually require some uh, DAC or uh, ADCs um, at the interface between the block and the external. Okay, so advantage of this, in fact, is uh, computation speed could be high. Uh, disadvantage of this design is in it's really um, having high power consumption, and particularly the ADC designs and could be uh, complicated. Well, um, commonly right now people work on the uh, spike-based designs. Um, so all the signals are represented by spike trains, okay? Um, so the design concept itself is closer to biological systems and offer very high power consumption. And if you've been uh, the session of the spiking neural networks and one obvious and disadvantage of this is in, uh, the data need a train of and spikes to represent and therefore the processing time surely is longer compared to the level design, okay? Um, so talking to like real implementations and um, here on the left hand, I show the device and the cell structure. Uh, uh, the interaction here is the cross section of the device. So um, RM device and can be made in between mental one and the mental two. Okay, array-wise, and we could do uh, realize the array in like one R design, or one T one R or one S one R. So here is saying like within each cell, like what uh, materials and devices is necessary. For example, one R indicating there's only one memory store device, and one T one R means within each cell there is a transistor and also memory store, they connect it in series. 1S1R is uh, replace the transistor with a dedicated design the selector material, okay? So um, 1T1R right now is the most uh, popular. Um, although uh, its cell size is still the largest, its offer is the best controllability. Um, and uh, we are able to access the cells like uh, read information from it. Okay, uh, at early uh, development stage, and this is still very important. Um, so conventionally designs, and we usually have an analog driver to provide the read voltage. Um, so this read voltage is provided to the column of the devices, okay? And then the current, uh, imagine we supply the voltage of, to the word lines, and, so uh, the uh, this device is, it could be turned on depends on you know whether spikes is here or not, and then the current could flow from the uh, the the read voltage into the bit line, and then we collect the the current uh, at the bit lines and translate into the outputs. Okay, uh, in our designs, what we propose is to tie the source line to uh, ground, and then. Uh, uh, it's uh, eliminated this uh, analog driver, okay? Um, and then we have a spike generation uh, components tied to the lines. Uh, uh, basically, it's also detecting the current 
uh, of the bit lines and uh, generate the uh, spikes. Okay. Well, and here is the illustration of the spike conversations. And so column current will go through a current amplifier design and then followed by an integrated fire circuit. Okay. Um, so if we make a chart to characterize the spike conversion circuit, and then larger column current will lead to fast charging and discharging of the capacitor, and then the output spike frequency uh, kind of an increases, right? So the higher of the current, and then the higher of the spike uh, frequency. And then, uh, so um, at the beginnings, and as you can see, it's demonstrating close to linear relationships. However, when the charging and discharging becomes really fast, the delay of the comparator uh, and the reset transistor will limit the spike generation speed. And therefore, uh, our measurements show there's a plateau or saturated spike of frequency. And that's lead to the non-linearity. And in our designs, then we tend to uh, leverage the linear region and also non-linear region for uh, inference and training. And here is the more detailed of the uh, 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 schematic of the design. Um, uh, I guess and you don't have to jump into the details. And um, the key is and um, we use output of the op amp uh, to form a positive feedback um, to accelerate the response of the uh, CA current uh, amplifier. We also use the current mirror designs to scale the uh, beeline current um, because in, in real designs and there are so many rows in an array, so the current scale, uh, we tend to make it to fit into the linear regions. So there must be a mapping. Okay, um, and the um, CA drives the bit line and the source line uh, sinks the current by connecting to the ground. And therefore the op uh, here stabilize the read voltage by the virtual shot, okay. Um, a, additional phase compensation is necessary because then we have a two positive feedbacks, okay. As I mentioned, one is on the op side and another is on the FC positive feedback. So we need to adjust the pole of uh, the two components and make sure uh, they uh, match with each other. So right-hand side are the uh, simulation of the CA designs. Um, and as you can see, the input current range could uh, from 10 micron to, minute, uh, to 1 million. And they can, uh, you know, all uh, works in this linear region. And also the stabilized and beeline voltage, uh, uh, I mean, the beeline voltage and uh, maintains and stabilized and during, during this range. Um, and uh, the bottom figure actually show with the appropriate phase compensation compensations, the response uh, can quickly converge to the stable state. And that's very important in real uh, hardware implementation as well, okay. Um, so in, Neural network implementation, in fact, then there is always an activation function. Um, so ReLU is the most popular, as you know, right? Um, however, ReLU is not good for uh, some networks and because uh, it doesn't have an upper boundary. So what we proposed is called in-situ nonlinear activation functions. And um, basically we use this designs to um, uh, uh, realize uh, clip the ReLU or tangent functionalities, okay. Um, on the left-hand side, um, in our designs, we do have a knobs, uh, reference voltage here, and the threshold voltage over here to help and regulate the shape of, um, you know, uh, this activation functionality, okay. Um, and uh, on this page, I provide an um, overall architecture of this in, in situ, uh, nonlinear activation function uh, supported um, processing engine design. Um, it's very alike of the memory design. The major difference here is on the top. Um, we actually can provide the input images 
um, and through the word line can chose um, supply the inputs to the RM array. So in computation in computing mode, instead of them go through the data uh, to read and write logics and the data will go through uh, the top path to current Humphrey fire integrant fire circuits and then the counters in order to generate the output. So this is the overall uh, spiking computing in memory uh, processing uh, engine design. Okay. Well, um, the design itself, uh, we, um, in, uh, we tested on small networks like MNIST and Sapphire 10. Okay, there are uh, a lot of the measurement results and, and here I just to show one on the uh, accuracy. So for each group of the applications and we have an ideal in black that's indicating the Accuracies we obtained by using um, by using uh, analog state of the device. Okay, uh, and this is obtained at algorithm level. And the red is in do the binary bi binary uh, binary neural network designs and for the same structure. So there's a slight uh, accuracy uh, job. Okay, um, the blue one is an um, programmed. So um, I mean, the blue versus the red also has some performance degradation um, in reality. This is um, because in, um, in pure um, BNN designs, right, we have a value of a positive and negative one. And uh, in physical implementations, and the region of the uh, programmable range is very limited. Um, so we see uh, some um, performance drop over here. Um, and this isn't based on the calculation. This is like, if we have this and BNNs and the map to the device directly, what do we expect it to uh, obtain? And the green is the real measurement results, okay? So as you can say, uh, especially for the larger networks, um, the accuracy job uh, can be uh, annotated. And so it's not that big for the smaller uh, networks and it's more sensitive to uh, like binarization uh, and also uh, the impact of the device values. We also uh, kind of measure, uh, for example, for this in CNN implementations and uh, across different layers, right? Uh, what is the utilization percentage, um, you know, across different layers uh, in terms of a synapse number, uh, MAC, and uh, uh, latencies. So, um, as you can say, uh, for synapse, for instance, fully connected or dominant in these designs, but computation wise and convolutional layer, uh, you know, consumes more MACs uh, and the latencies. Okay. This is a summary of our chip. Um, our demo video is online. If you go click this uh, uh, link uh, due to the time limit, and I uh, don't uh, like introduce here. Okay. We also compared our uh, chips in with the prior results. Um, very quickly summaries as compares to um, uh, conventional and uh, uh, RM based designs, and we have an small chip area and the much higher uh, uh, power efficiency, okay? So this is a quite detailed uh, introduction on our spiking based and processing uh, engine design. Um, in fact, uh, in addition to, uh, you know, this version of the designs, we extended um, the P designs to different spiking versions. Um, so the previous one is more like uh, recoding based. Uh, we also interested in the temporal coding and also single spike coding. coding. So um, single spike coding means in using one spike and it's in temporal information to indicate the amplitude of the uh, input signal and output signal, okay, to represent the data information. Um, so, um, here actually is another of uh, our designs. And um, this design is divided into three stages. The first stage, translate timing of the input spikes to an analog voltage. Uh, 
um, it used the charting process of uh, composites and CGD as a reference. Um, and then the green curve here shows the voltage on the capacitor of a CGD. So the uh, green curve actually is always used as the reference. So when input spike comes in, and then the voltage will be sampled. And then the sampled voltage um, denote as a V in here, for example, the blue one or the purple ones um, is approximately a pro uh, proportional to the input spike time, okay? Um, second stage is for the computation. Computation, so all the weighing signals are uh, applied to the RM crossbar array and perform the matrix operation, right? And uh, during the computations, and the C clock is charged, and the charging speed is determined by the V line current. Okay, this isn't very alike as in our previous explanation. The third stage um, is the upper stage. So what does it do? Is and uh, uh, compare the C clock with, uh, in fact, the CGD over here. Uh, so CGD is again used as in reference and then translate the CCOG, charge on the CCOG back to and timing information. So this is the uh, spike, output spike generated, okay? Um, so in this design, and as you can see, the um, basic concept is in using one single spike to represent the data and therefore the data transmission cost and can be uh, much lower. Um, we also have been working on uh, you know, the architecture development and the one common, uh, where, uh, one common uh, situation we faced uh, in accelerated design is the kernel mapping um, and uh, parallelism execution. Well, um, so our work called pipe layer uh, in HPC 2017 and trying to solve the issue. Um, if you, uh, you know, uh, the top one coming from like uh, mm, DNN designs. So for convolutional operations and here is the input feature map and here is the convolutional kernels and here is the uh, output feature map. So a very um, straightforward mapping method is in each kernel uh, we can angle in a form in ver uh, vertical uh, columns of the vector uh, are represent over here, okay? And then uh, for the input data, and we also, for each set of the input data, so we can enroll and use as in the uh, input vector, okay? So in this way, the entire input feature maps and will form a group of uh, uh, a series of uh, input uh, vectors and it will be supplied to the crossbar arrays one by one. And uh, each execution will uh, generate one pixel um, you know, at the outputs, right? And uh, uh, eventually we're going to form all the outputs, okay? So this is a straightforward mapping, um, but uh, uh, as you can see, the execution could take uh, many uh, cycles to complete. So, um, uh, one another uh, quite straightforward uh, following up is to improve the parallelism in execution. So, for example, we could duplicate the structure and then partition the input vectors into groups, so they can supply to the different cross of uh, different crossbar arrays for execution. And this is a very typical practice by trading off the spatial space, uh, spatial uh, cost in, uh, to obtain the uh, execution benefit, okay? And in this work, we also talking about on how to conduct it pipeline the training schemes. Um, again, due to the time limit, and I don't, um, you know, touch those details, and, but if you're interested, feel free to refer the paper or email me for more details. Um, one thing I like to talk followed by the pipe layer work uh, is in how do we partition the parallelisms in execution. So previously, 
um, we focus mainly on uh, within each layers, like um, how can we use more arrays and improve the parallelism. And in our uh, high power work, we discuss the uh, data parallelism versus a model parallelism. Um, and what we find is, and uh, first of all, in accelerator designs, and usually we have many such kind of processing elements on chip. So we need to partition a layer to many parts uh, and use a multiple uh, PE and processing engines. Okay. And when we do this in partitions, we could uh, make uh, uh, like uh, duplicate the models and supply the same uh, data, partition the data, uh, you know. Um, so we see this is a model parallelism. We can also uh, apply the same data to different PEs, but each PE is executing a part of the, uh, the convolutions, okay? So, uh, so we call uh, data parallelism versus a model parallelism. The interesting finding in this research is in, um, for different layers, we could apply uh, different parallelism schemes in order to optimize the final uh, design implementation. Okay, um, so uh, this indicating that uh, when we have the hardware designs and when we apply the algorithms on the hardware and the understanding of the software uh, will benefit this implementation. Okay, so this actually conclude the part on uh, neuromorphic chip designs. Uh, my last part uh, technical part is in talking about the co-design. So the motivation over here is in, in neuromorphic designs, we face a lot of challenges and uh, the capability of the hardware usually is limited. So a lot of times we need to make trade-off between uh, algorithm and the hardware design. And it's better to integrate effort together for the optimization. So co-design are uh, very popular uh, in novel days, um, and I'm going to uh, just I'm going to just uh, briefly talking about the examples, um, how to improve the efficiency and the reliability. So uh, efficiency, I will use in compression techniques as example, and the reliability, and um, I will show that particular for the RN designs, the reliability improvement need to be across in all the layers. Okay, so uh, first of all, compression techniques. Um, in fact, uh, when we're talking about the uh, network designs, okay, there are many types of uh, compression techniques, uh, including compact model design, quantization, pruning, sparsification, um, decomposition, and so on and so forth. So, Compact model design is a pure exploration of the BNN architecture, right? Uh, and the other three are tightly integrated with the hardware design. In fact, uh, right now, there also, recently, there also works on NAS, uh, neural architecture search, uh, uh, like searching compact uh, model designs and for given hardware. Uh, I, I will just uh, uh, you know, bypass this part uh, for now. Uh, and uh, only introduce in some common techniques and for uh, the following, right? So, um, so for example, specification is a quite popular approach. Um, uh, we know the uh, DNA models, for instance, usually have a high level of a redundancy. So we can prune unnecessary neurons or remove and needed neurons uh, with their unrelated synapse. And that can dramatically reduce the storage and computation cost, right? Um, and as the figure show here, um, sometimes more than 80 or 90% of the weight parameters can be eliminated, okay? Well, um, Years ago, when people, uh, especially in machine learning domains, are working on this in thread, um, they are pretty interested in reduce the synapse 
uh, number, the weight numbers, okay? Um, and uh, the figure, um, and that they actually be able to obtain very high sparsity, like the curve show it here. Well, the interesting thing is and when we apply those in, um, pruned the needle uh, uh, models on hardware, we find um, although the sparsification level is pretty high, the real hardware implementation can only obtain marginal speed up or uh, for some cases, the performance degraded. And this made us uh, very curious and it's turned out uh, conventional specification method at the algorithm level will result in random sparsity, okay? And then to us uh, at hardware implementations, uh, it will lead to irregular memory accesses, poor data localities, and therefore it doesn't uh, uh, translate into uh, tremendous speed up as expected, okay? And what we aimed is and um, we call it structure sparsity. So um, uh, it's induced and in, we tend to induce in regular memory accesses, improve the data locality and obtain the uh, real speed up. And it has to be uh, made through uh, combining the software and hardware customization. And I will go through this and pretty quickly. Um, so we call our methodology is in structure sparsity learning, okay? The left-hand side shows the regularization we applied, okay? The implementation is quite simple, right? We add in group plus so uh, during the training uh, through the back propagations. So here, um, E is the last function, ED is the last function, um, and uh, RW is an L2 norm regularization. So usually we have it to avoid overfeeding, right? And the RG is the newly added group plus O terms, okay? Um, so the entire thing formed the uh, regularization uh, term. So, um, I mean, uh, when we apply structured sparsity learnings and we can uh, form the group in different ways, right? So in a figure, um, the large white cube are feature maps, and then a small uh, solid cube are 3D filters containing all the weights. Uh, a group is highlighted by red or blue shadows, okay? So, so the first structure sparsity, uh, as we illustrate over here, is the 3D filter-wise and structure sparsity. Um, so this kind of sparsity remove any important 3D filters. And uh, in uh, GMM computations, Removing 3D filter um, is equivalent to remove rows of the weight matrices. Another way is a channel wise then specification uh, corresponding to the column removal in the weight matrices. Okay. And similarly, we can apply the groups to the filter shapes or the depth of the layers. Okay. The code uh, can be found online. And if you're uh, interesting to practice this, okay. Um, so um, I remove all the result parts and perhaps, and, but for this one, um, uh, uh, as you can uh, see on our papers, and we obtain the true uh, speed ups on hardware execution, okay. Well, uh, um, I, uh, I mean, a rank clipping actually is a decomposition method, okay. Uh, for example, it's used in low rank approximation techniques, okay? What, are we, what we do is an introduced in a principal component approximation PCA into the training processes, okay? So for each layer, we decompose its matrix into U and V transpose um, and uh, reduce its rank to K, okay? In this way, then uh, the computation cost can be reduced uh, the drawback is, and um, you know, through this and its results uh, reconstruction error, and that's why we integrate it into the training processes, and then through the retraining uh, by iterations, we gradually reduce the rank uh, for the uh, in the PCA. 
um, it can be shown by the result here. So as you can see here, the black line shows the accuracy. Uh, so through the training iterations, the accuracy is sustained. And if we observe in different layers, right, the rank uh, ratios and gradually reduced until it's reached to uh, plateau the, uh, the saturation, okay? And uh, the reduction of the rank ratio for different layers are uh, a little bit different, okay? The result bottom line shows um, the rank clipping results obtain similar accuracy as original design, while uh, um, directly a lower rank approximation, um, you can see its accuracy is much lower and not a tolerable. And if you're taking a look at the rank, um, you know, through the gradually rank clippings, and we're able to obtain a similar rank as the directly uh, uh, LRA. So, uh, basically, we maintained accuracy, but reduced the computation cost, okay? Um, in fact, we also have a more approach and tend to uh, combine the compression techniques and all together. For example, um, our work on ICML 2020, we call it in Penny. It's divide the entire oper uh, operation into four steps. Uh, the step, a is in kernel decomposition. It's used in low rank approximation as I mentioned on the previous. And step B is alternate the retraining um, and uh, it's integrated sparsity regularization. And the step C is pruning. Um, and at this stage, we conduct the unstructured pruning. And then uh, step B is the model shrinking. Uh, it's a go back to the structure pruning again to uh, regularize on what we obtained on the step C, okay? So um, this is just an example of an, um, combining various techniques, okay? I don't go to a lot of details today. Um, what I really wanted to say is and the method can be taken as a general approach of a software and hardware co-design. Uh, it can also be applied to in-memory computing as well. Uh, so there are a lot of an, uh, efforts in, by uh, many researchers uh, in this direction. Well, uh, related to the in-memory computing, and the reliability has been a concern. Uh, in fact, for any new device-based uh, studies and reliability, uh, endurance, and generally the designs and robustness and has been a concern, right? So for RM, for instance, and what we observed is and um, weight stability could be uh, an issue in uh, real implementation. Um, so the left figure shows during the recall, during inference, the absolute resistance value of RM cells and drift. So meaning uh, since uh, we apply the voltage across device, uh, every time it results in tiny resistance change and accumulatively the overall resistance then will be changed dramatically. So um, even we use the difference of two cells for one data representation, the difference also drift and uh, eventually cause the degradation of a neural network accuracy. Okay, so for this work, uh, we propose a so-called arrogant principle. Um, our higher level is in, um, we tend to mimic practice makes perfect approach. So we assume, like, we assume that during inference, every inference result is correct. So we use the inference results um, to control the uh, inferencing uh, uh, input, um, the, what does it say, to, uh, up to control the input conditions uh, during the next inference operations, okay? And in this way, you know, when we apply positive and negative voltage across the devices and we could compensate the weight deviation slightly, okay? And uh, in this work, we introduce a closed loop design. Um, so it's provided real-time feedback um, uh, and then 
you know, the change of this and the result over here can be reflected to control um, the working condition, operating condition of the next cycle. Okay, so the expectation is to adaptively compensate the resistance deviation. Um, and uh, because some tiny disturbance in per excesses, we propose to integrate resistance and compensation into the regular inference operations. Okay, and the, our result, in fact, is some pretty interesting as well. Um, First of all, the results can show uh, with um, arrogant principle applied, the lifetime can be dramatically uh, increased, right? However, uh, interesting thing uh, we observed is that once the predictions start getting wrong, it's aggregate the drifting, right? And then the classification accuracy uh, drops in pretty uh, quickly. Okay, not like previously, it's changing uh, gradually. Okay, so uh, this is an, the trade-offs of uh, uh, reliability improvement and also the degradation speed. Okay. This is a more like at circuit level. Um, recently, we've been working on the system level reliability uh, improvement. Um, so over here, we recently proposed an RM-based stochastic noise alert training. Um, this based on the observation, like in fact, during the operation, there are a lot of a dynamic noise, including thermal noise, short noise, and RTN, um, programming noise, and so on and so forth. Okay. And when we have in those noises included, what we find is that's uh, uh, kind of an uh, degrade the overall design performance and um, pretty uh, large, pretty largely. Um, and it's also related to the uh, design configurations, like what is the cell resolution to be take, um, you know, what is the area constraints and, um, you know, what's the operation uh, frequencies and so on so first. Okay. So um, what we do, um, over here is an, if we apply uh, our proposed um, uh, re-SNA, uh, RM-based stochastic, uh, stochastic noise aware trainings, we are able to obtain better inference accuracy under uh, even the same configuration. However, meanwhile, um, through, the, um, through the analysis, and we also find that uh, the design trade-off and um, doesn't lead to a global optimization, a global design configuration. For example, if we like to, uh, if we aim to the, uh, the best inference accuracy versus uh, the best energy consumptions and the design configuration in terms of, uh, for example, cell resolution and crossbar size um, are different. Okay, so the goal of the work is to find a design configuration um, with the minimum cost by giving the uh, design specification. And this is in the overall design scheme. So uh, during the training, we still apply to RES and new trainings, okay? And we hope to uh, find the optimal hardware configuration based on the design objectives. The challenge here is um, the number of uh, available choices um, is a combination of, uh, it's a combination problem, right? It's a combination of uh, available uh, uh, selection criteria, um, and a fully hardware training process will take a lot of time, right? Uh, so this is not simple, this is and takes longer time. Okay, so um, um, so uh, what we propose in this work is a multi-objective optimization in order to reduce the uh, calculation cost and uh, lead us into the optimal hardware configuration. So uh, here is an one example uh, we conducted for ResNet 20. And the number here, all the points um, are the uh, you know, exploration numbers, the design numbers, and the only those uh, points lying down Prato front are shown over here. Um, 
So, you know, based on this analysis, in fact, we can identify which uh, configurations uh, will be, uh, you know, what we expected to satisfy the design objectives. And uh, with this, and we can also see that uh, uh, we can avoid high latency and high energy designs based on this and criteria and the budget. We can also see some uh, high cell resolution settings and for or high uh, frequency settings and um, appear in the preto front, okay, due to benefiting from the uh, our training methodology, okay. Um, this um, concludes my second part. Essentially, what I wanted to say here is um, uh, for neuromorphic computings, again, a large part uh, research devoted into the hardware design, um, but it's uh, related to the software, closely uh, related to the software. So algorithm and hardware design, um, uh, co-design is very, very important. All right, uh, we have an, about 10 minutes and I'm going to conclude the talk quickly, uh, talking about the challenge and uh, uh, opportunities, okay? Um, I've been working on nanotechnology-inspired computing, okay? So essentially, we tend to uh, utilize new material and devices that offer a lot of uh, new characteristics uh, to build uh, neuromorphic computing systems. Um, I, I wouldn't say like we can achieve the function level of the brain and the approach to that. Um, as you can see, this thread of the research uh, involves many um, you know, detailed research topics uh, from functionality to power efficiency to entire roles like system development, software development, uh, design automation, and so on so forth. So, um, you know, a, a tremendous uh, effort are necessary and uh, still expected. Um, and uh, for neuromorphic designs, um, people have done a lot and people have uh, had a lot of the understanding. However, during the implementations, um, you know, there are still many debates, okay? Um, as you can say, uh, in existing uh, practices and uh, people could take digital approach versus analog approach. Uh, we talk about like level-based designs and spiking-based designs. Uh, one to conduct the synchronized operations and one to conduct the asynchronized operations. Um, whether CMOS can afford the design or post the silicons are necessary. So uh, if you ask different people, uh, they could offer you uh, different answers or have uh, their own preference. So um, there, there's no kind of consensus and so far. I guess we don't want a consensus, um, but you know, when you choose the technology and approaches, and many things and, uh, need to be considered. Um, also platforms, I guess, and um, when talking about the platforms, the simplest way is to utilize the existing, uh, uh, you know, hardware platforms like CPU and GPUs, right? We could um, also use an FPGAs and that offer uh, program abilities. Application specific IC designs and could um, provide um, better efficiency, but design cycle is low. And of course, and for uh, emerging device-based designs, and uh, there uh, will be more uh, dedicating research efforts in front. What I illustrate here is um, for different platforms, and they offer different trade-offs. So when we selecting those platforms, you know those uh, matrices, and the more of them uh, need to be considered. Um, another thing, um, particular for um, any intelligence systems is um, security and the privacy. And this emerged more and more important in, you know, uh, in the past uh, one, two years. So uh, what we find is and when we're developing the intelligence systems, right? Data model applications are the essential elements and they all connect together. Um, in other words, all these elements and that the connections in between and could be uh, attacked, right? Um, hardware is also part of it. 
and especially the danger part is in any uh, tech integrated on the neuromorphic computing hardware designs and it will be emerged later, it could be even more dangerous. But from another hand, we can also using the unique uh, feature of the devices to help uh, you know, uh, protect our system. So in this work, what we do is an explore the memory store drifting effect, right? Um, so intentionally uh, degrading the performance in network. Uh, what we done is in comparison to the naive with the versus revised design, the revised designs could aggravate the uh, resistance drifting. So under this uh, assumptions, and when we apply the same design on these systems, and once it's operate at certain times, the performance will be degraded dramatically and all the information will be gone. The prediction is wrong uh, and uh, the stored information on this device is not useful. So uh, it's not a perfect solution. What I wanted to point out is, um, you know, sometimes and we need uh, different thinkings, um, leverage the device properties to improve uh, uh, or protect our data and the design. All right. So uh, to summarize um, quickly, future computing systems um, we envision will be more user-friendly. It must be automatic and that the cost efficiency is uh, necessary. Um, and uh, as I talk about the uh, neuromorphic computings, and uh, again, it must be a multidisciplinary efforts, integrating device level circuit architecture, system, algorithm. Also, in fact, uh, we work with the uh, neuron science uh, in order to understand better on our uh, neuron systems. Um, there are many challenges, um, but also it's indicating there are a lot of opportunities in front, okay? Um, all right, so this is all I have for today. Um, any questions are welcome, yeah. Thanks, Helen. Do we have questions from the audience? This could be a long day today. <laughs> for you or what? I mean, for our audience. <laughs> yes, yeah. We started early in the morning. At least. It depends yeah. which time zone you're in, I guess. Right. Um, I... Hi, Helen. Helen. Hi, Javier. How are you? Good. Hey, thanks for the talk. This was amazing. So, Thank you. And your background is also pretty good. <laughs> yeah, it's a fake background. This is the advantage of um, doing the virtual environment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, thanks a lot for taking out time and doing this. So a lot of thanks. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I also see the baby. Yeah, sorry, I'm chasing her here. So. Yeah. New generation. I know, next generation of researchers. She's already participating in all the talks. Yeah. She's already neural network expert. Yeah, thanks for yes. doing this, Helen. Like I said, it's a new, in new initiative, so hopefully it's useful. Thanks for Avaral also for organizing this, Avaral and Akash. Sure. So, I mean, if any questions, I actually uh, have the uh, widgets on the ES Week website and any questions, then feel free to email me. Well, questions? Oh, I see some questions on the chat window. I can quickly answer this. Um, Um, Ayasha asked, um, I was wondering how the neuromorphic hardware or uh, Intel OE is different from Google TPU. Um, are there no such systolic array in neuromorphic hardware? How do they implement a huge matrix modification that we have in AN and convert it as in an um, especially? 
Um, so Google TPU, uh, as you mentioned, is using systolic array. Uh, the design itself and uh, the, systolic, the systolic, uh, uh concept itself is not like a file inspired. So the effort is mainly to improve the execution efficiency. Well, uh, for example, Loihi or the other neuromorphic hardware, the effort is mainly like how to mimic the biologic systems in terms of the connection, the activation function, or uh, in the uh, training methodology. So these are two, um, the, uh, uh, two uh, research directions, and they actually uh, diagonal to each other and orthogonal to each other and can be combined. Um, another question is, and what makes MemRister a good choice for neuromorphic computing systems? Um, I explained pre uh, previously, I guess, um, the uh, several things. One is in the simple structure, the analog to the matrix operation. Um, it's a uh, non-volatile, so it can sustain the information. Um, um, also, um, it, it, it's extremely low power consumption. Okay, so this is uh, generally what people tracing uh, when developing uh, the neuromorphic computing. I do hope um, there are uh, other nano devices will be available in the future and can uh, further improve uh, the capabilities. Yeah. So yeah, I guess, and this is all I have. <laughs> awesome, thanks. Um, yeah, so also um, I mentioned it early in the earlier talk, we have a keynote tomorrow morning at um, yeah, 10 a.m. Eastern uh, by Mike Davis, who leads the Intel Neuromorphic Lab. So um, he'll be talking about Loihi, I guess. Um, but that's not the only architecture that exists, as we've heard now, right? So just FYI for the audience. Well, there's another question in the chat. Helen. Oh, uh, FinFAT, better than, uh, yeah. So uh, in fact, if you go to IEDM, ISCC, um, there are many discussions on using um, spin, uh, FinFAT uh, for neuromorphic technology. So I personally feel like uh, for um, logic-based operations, it has a uh, tremendous opportunity. I think now we can close the recording. Okay.